I'm delighted to be joined by Dave Hunt from Anown the Thrack today. Dave, how we were just talking before we started rolling about 2020 in general. But from a musical perspective, how has it been for you? Because I've been doing these interviews all year and releasing music in a situation like this is something that I don't envy of any musician. But Anown the Thrack are one of the bands that seem to have had a good 2020. So how is the equilibrium balance of that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of ironic that anyone would have a good year in a year like this. You know, I've, I've referred to it a few times in, like, emails I've sent to people and that recently as a nut punch of a year. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it has been, I don't think. I don't think anyone's had the greatest of times, but but weirdly, yeah, it, it's turned out to be quite good for us. And, and not that I would want to say it's good that everything happened that happened in 2020, you know, oh, well, I'm all right. Um, but yeah, there's this strange irony about it all. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had a nice time in, insofar as we've been able to put out an album, obviously. That's why we're having this conversation. Um, and... It's been well received. I mean, one of the things about the way there's been lockdowns and very restricted things that people can go and do, you know, even outside of a lockdown, you can't necessarily go to the pub on a Friday night. Like yeah. Going out on, you know. um, and one of the things people are doing is sitting at home and listening to music. Um, so I think for, for people putting music out, it's been, ironically, um, a reasonably good time to do it. The only thing is, obviously, when you when you put something out and you're a band like us, or even possibly slightly more conventional than us, um, you go on tour. That's that's the obvious thing yeah. that you do with any release. Um, so yeah, there's none of that. <laughs> um, and it it was interesting because we we finished the recording just before the pandemic really got really got going. Um, so that well, around the start of March, I think we handed it over to Metal Blade, the record label, um, and we didn't really know what was about to happen, you know. Yeah. Um, and then when the pandemic did kick off, and it became clear that it, it just wasn't going to work in the way that it normally might, people were going, "Oh, yeah, it's all right. We'll put it back a little bit." You know, this tour that we were going to do in April, yeah, we'll do it in September, and everything will be fine, and. And so on and so forth. And, yeah, I mean, we're reasonably good friends with the guys who put together in the UK. I think this is kind of going out all over the place. But in the yeah. UK, we have the Damnation Festival, you may have yeah, heard of. Yeah, of course. And that takes place quite late in the year, to, you know, after the end of festival season kind of thing mm. in November. And it was speaking to some of those sort of, you know, off the records, is this going to happen? Is it... And everyone thought, by the end of the year, it was it was all going to be back to normal, and it <laughs> here we are. Here we are in December, like ah. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm still getting things like we we've got a, a booking agent in America, um, mm. and I got a, an email off him a while ago, and there's a, some guys in Europe that that run some booking agency kind of thing, and they got in touch with me, going, you know, when can we? When can we put some of it together? Because, you know, the, like I say, we've, we've had a quite good year in terms of putting an album out that's gone well and people seem to like it and all of that. So when can we finally do the the the, 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 the real world payoff for that in terms of shows and stuff? And I, all I can do is reply to them going, I don't know, mate. How long is a piece of string, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, everyone thought that we'd be doing everything normal again by September and now we're not. Here we are, December. Okay, so there's a vaccine now. Ace. Does that mean yeah. next week we can go out? And say, well, no. You know that's that's not how it works. So, so it's been this really strange thing. You know, the, the album, like I say, the album has has been quite well received. We're yeah. really happy with how it came out. It's been quite successful in terms of you know we did, we got on a couple of charts. We did, got lots of streams and all of that kind of stuff that you mm. can measure. But then at the same time, it's just been crazy and mental and, and who knows what's going on at the same time. You know, it's, it's been a weird could, one. Could I ask you about the sonic direc uh, direction that Nathrak have taken, particularly on the last two, uh, on the last two releases? Because what really appeals to someone like myself is I like big, horrible noise, right? As I'm sure a lot of people who follow all things not fest do. But the addition of melody and the addition of sonic clarity is something that really stands Nathrak out. 
in that its heaviness isn't reliant upon lo-fi recording. Um, where is the thinking behind sonic clarity? Because I hear some, like, major label butt rock bands with worse production values than Nathrak. Like, what's the thinking there? Because traditionally, things that come from more extreme terrains, like, muddy in the sound is part of it, but... I love the fact that Nathrak records are like horrible, nasty blockbuster movies. <laughs> it's like Michael Bay in a in a blender. Or That's something. it, absolutely, absolutely. Like Cronenberg and Bay had a baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, interesting thought. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly heard plenty of productions that were intentionally awful. Um, mm. You know. Um, if I think back to old Borsum stuff or or Dark Throne and, and things, like, you know, they, they, they don't want it to be nice. It's not they couldn't do any better. Yeah. Um, it's, in our case, it's not not that we ever did particularly have some kind of idea that it must be awful in some respect. Um, which, I mean, when we first started out, we t- I mean we started out because we've always recorded ourselves. Mm. So we, when we very first started out, we had like a, a four or eight track thing that recorded on C90 tapes. And I mean, it was, we didn't have any money. We didn't know yeah. what we were doing. You know, we were doing our best. And Mick was learning his craft as a producer and that. Um, and we switched to a, to a digital desk that had a, a hard dish built in and all that. Oh, my God. The, the, the marvel. What a time to be alive. You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had to try and figure out a way to make it sound a bit scuzzier again. Yeah. Um, so... Th- I do know that I do know what you mean, but but basically the the change more recently has just been getting better at it. You know, it's, it's not like until until the last couple of albums we had a commitment to right. sound a, a bit crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just yeah, Mick Mick actually works. But people who know who we are probably know, but this yeah. might be watched by someone who doesn't. So basically, the band is me. And my partner in crime, Mick, um, we work with other guys live, but it's me and Mick for the most part. Mick actually works outside of the band as a producer. Um, so he's been doing a, basically a lot of that work over the last few years, got a lot better at doing it. Um, and it's also it's to do with what feels right at the time. That's that's basically what is our driving um direction like how we decide what to do is what feels right at the time mm. and we you start recording an album and to a certain extent you have to follow it where it goes you know you you, you it's a bit of a journey i know that's like some kind of weird cliche thing to say but it, it kind of is and an album has to be allowed to be itself um so to an extent the way that feels right for one album to be might not have that clarity and everything that, mm. that another album does you know i I was I was listening yesterday to Electric Wizards album Dope Throne. Yes. Um, if someone I, I did hear a few years ago that someone had remastered or remixed it or something like that, and I found that idea offensive. Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, because it is perfect in its imperfection. You know, it's mm. not supposed to sound like Sinatra Live at the Sands or or whatever it is that sounds a million quid. It's meant to sound like it does, um, mm. and we have had a bit of that. But more recently. It's been those two things. Mick is simply better than he was years ago at doing this kind of thing. But it felt right for the for the music as well. Um, and sending, you know, we we send masters back and forth. I'll send Mick, you know, notes how I think things might change. He'll say yes or no to things, and so on. Um, yeah. And just the the end result of that process, what we felt was the right way for it to be, just has a bit more of that clarity to it now. Um, and I think it works. I think it works, personally. How has working with Mick's eyes, ears and mind changed with with Bleeding Through being back on the wheel and with all of his production stuff? Like, how has it changed in, in recent times? Have, have you felt within Mick um, a change in the way that ideas work and therefore the change in your songwriting dynamic in recent years? Or is it... Business as usual, and mix eyes, ears, and mind will change the people that he works with. I think of the two, it's probably more the latter. Mm. Uh, but also, Mick um, Mick is is well capable of working in a way that's appropriate for whatever it is that he's working on. Mm. Um, 
So, so if maybe he's best known among some uh, some people as as one part Nathrak, um, but that doesn't mean that he's going to insist that if he's working with leading through or or you know who else has he worked with? Is it eighteen vision? There's some like quite yeah. big band. And that. he's not going to insist they've got blast beats all the time and, and you know, that you can't understand any of the words and it's all going to be horrible. It's, it's about what's right for the thing that you're, that you're doing. Um, so when it comes to the, the stuff that we do in Anal Nathrak, but is there an influence? Well, I suppose it's impossible that subconsciously there might be, uh, there wouldn't be rather. Um, but no, it, it still feels very much, it feels more than anything. It feels like it did when we first started still. You know, we we started out as two kids in his dad's house d- downstairs. Mick had the front room as his bedroom, and we started out just making it up on the spot there. It still feels kind of like that, to be honest. We're just, you know, we're better at it, I hope. Yeah. It's, um, that that feels like. Sorry, I cut you off, Dave, but that feels like such a bizarre concept because we've watched. It, um, now I live in the states now, but back but back home. Um, like we've seen things like Sabaton go into arenas with these colossal choruses that I, it, just my personal opinion, can't hold a candle to the Nathrak choruses on this <laughs> new record, right? It does, it, like the, the thing about Nathrak at this point in time in 2020, Dave, like um, I will be straight up with you. I, I'm something of a newcomer. I came in on the last record, but something that stands out about your band is your logo is terrifying. Your name is terrifying. Quite frequently, your music is terrifying. But now there is this massive gleaming diamond in the centre of it with these huge monolithic choruses, man. Um, Do you believe that Nathrak are an underground proposition in 2020? Because, like... that the the last couple of records in particular to me seem bigger than just being a n other underground metal release. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the term underground. I I would call it um, indexical. That, that that means it it relates very much to your own perspective. Yeah. So the word I or now or here words like that are are indexical because they only relate to from where you're coming from yeah. and underground is almost always used by whoever it is to describe what they do themselves in a good way right <laughs> and not being underground is a bad thing but they're never that themselves and yeah. so you know I, I don't i don't know what the word means in in any objective sense uh, what's underground i mean this I've got I've got a mate who lives in Sweden, right? And he does he does basically backwards looking death metal all the time because right. that's what means something to him. And there's nothing wrong with that. I listen to that just as much as anybody else. Um, but he solidly has a claim to this underground title. Um, but you know, we're we're talking that as a result of this not fest thing of the yeah. has kind of reference to Slipknot and everything. That there are plenty of people like him who would despise all of that because they have their underground way of doing stuff. But then there's six and a half billion other people on earth who would call all of that kind of stuff very underground. Yeah, and, yeah, know, of course. It's kind of a, it's a movable feast, the term is. Um, so, I mean, I don't, one thing we're not doing is chasing some kind of, you know, commercial approach, the, 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 you know, yeah. the high sales and everything. It helps us if a record sells quite well, yeah. But we we don't write music so that that happens. So I suppose to that extent, it kind of makes sense to to call us something like that. But but other than that, I I, I honestly don't know. I mean, we we we're un, unapologetically fairly horrible at times. We also have you know the choruses you mentioned, bits and pieces that, yeah. are, that are very catchy, very you know you can. You can grab hold of you and, and they, you can grab hold of them and all of that kind of stuff. But like I say, the, the only way that we ever plan anything is what feels right. Yeah. So, so you know, underground, uh, overground, we're yeah. wumbling free. The reason, <laughs> the reason I'm laughing is because the concept of anybody who has an album cover with a pig with cocks for eyes doing anything for commercial appeal is <laughs> fucking mental on every level. Yeah, I suppose so. But it's... To be honest, I think it makes it makes less sense to think of 
creative stuff in terms of commercial appeal or lack thereof. Mm. I, I just think just chucking all of that out the window and doing, you know, I, I hate to use something like, you know, your own truth or, or yeah. anything bullshit like that. But, but that kind, you've got to go what feels right for you. You've got to follow your own you know, creative vision, whatever it is, you've got to do what's right for you to mm. do. And whether that is the kind of thing that millions of people are going to buy, nobody's going to buy it, doesn't matter. Do, mm. it, do it the right way. And that's that's the only way that you can proceed. But what is your take on how people uh, take warm to things? Because it's my opinion that everything that is at the top of festival lineups, not the bands that are second or third, the bands that headline were usually completely counterculture to their time, always create for themselves. Like when you when you look there genuinely at the top of it, like even bands like fucking Metallica and Maiden were the antithesis to what was going on at that point in time. When Metallica were breaking, it was hair metal that was the thing. If you were chasing the dime, that was the way to go. Um, yeah. So in that tradition, where do you think that kind of thinking ex like fits in 2020? Because it used to be smashing through boundaries and having creative ambition and the fact that these choruses are in amongst fucking brilliantly constructed it, it, it's reductive to just call it noise brilliantly constructive um industrial soundscapes and ear bleeding heavy metal is it possible for that to garner a major audience because i do i do right and when people hear nathrak they're taken aback. The chorus comes in, and I always watch, like, we're usually live on Twitch, right? So I see the comments shift when the chorus comes in, like, holy fuck, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Is it possible for a band like Nathrak to suddenly find themselves with loads of people interested? Yeah, I think it can be. Um, but... At the same time, you, you can never be entirely sure what it is that's going to trigger that kind of thing. Um, and spending time chasing it or worrying about it is yeah. unlike... Uh, no, no, no. Your, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting chasing it. I just mean as it is. You've created this art. How ca Like, can it reach loads of people? Because to my eyes and ears, it can. I walked around Bloodstock uh, doing a corporate job, right? Asking everyone, who was the first rock and metal band that you got into? And with the amount of people that say my now current employers, Slipknot, right? To me, to me, Nathrak could open an arena tour with Slipknot with the sound that they have. Like, this is not like you say throwing Burzum on there, but it still satisfies that same thing that fucking Burzum does. So, like, can this reach loads of people? Because to, to me, it feels like it can. Like, if the distribution was better, if this reached people... Because people stopped responding to rock and metal when that gate got shut, when the thing that was being pushed was the counter, was the, 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 the more extreme in terms of... Emo was the extreme to new metal, right? New metal was fucking jocks and boisterous, obnoxious heavy metal and rah... And emo was everything that that wasn't. So even that is counterculture. Is that has that lane been shut down forever, or or can something bulldoze through that that line anymore? I ask because you're someone who clearly creates from the right mindset. We create for us. We create the best music we can. Whoever likes it likes it. See you there, right? But, but can that reach people? Because it's to my mind that there are fucking millions of people that would love your record. <laughs> I'd love it if millions of people bought it. But, um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I do, I believe I, I, I get what you mean. Um, and, yeah, I, th I think that kind of thing is possible. Whether it's likely or not, I've no idea. But, whether, mm. but is it possible? Yeah, for, for two reasons to spring to mind. One, earlier today... Um, I was sat at home listening to music, not unusual for someone like uh, yourself or me. Um, and one of the things I was listening to was Nirvana. Um, yeah. Now, I would strongly imagine there's a, a weirdly 
a large overlap between a Slipknot kind of audience and a yeah. Nirvana kind of audience. The, the, these people will know um, yeah. the music that you're talking about. Um, and, I mean, the, the, the most important thing about Nirvana at all, kind of, other than the music, was this kind of outsider perspective, the, the refusal to compromise, and the fact that you can pair that with the fact that they became the biggest thing in the world yeah. at the time. Um, or at least, you know, up there. Um, okay, it didn't end well. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of thing can happen. Mm. Um, and also, to an extent, I mean, we, we was it the last album? We, did, we, did, we had one song that absolutely took off in the past couple of years um, called Forward. Forward, yeah. Um, I still haven't heard anyone mention to me that that's the motto of Birmingham, the word forward. It really? No, I did not know that. Yeah, little uh, little weird insight for you. Um, it's not the only thing it's about, obviously, no. but it's uh, like a, a link to it. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that song did really quite well um, mm. on like streaming platforms and, and stuff like that. Um, it's not like people are buying seven-inch vinyls anymore, but you, do, but yeah. you judge by whatever, you know, Spotify, whatever it is. Um, and that song went over quite a lot bigger than most, not all, but most of our songs had done previously. Um, so clearly there was a space, there was, there was a potential, there was, there was somewhere out there in the world that that song could fit into um, in a way that was a bit bigger and further reaching than many of our other songs. You know, it's not necessarily about what's better or worse, it's just what catches the moment, you know, what, what sounds right to a lot of people so that they add it to playlists, they, you know, they, they put it on the air, on the radio, whatever it is. Um, but we wrote that in exactly the same way that we write everything else. So, it's, I mean, and also it was on, what, I think our 10th album or something, you know. Yeah. This isn't, we haven't been going for six months and suddenly come up with a song that was quite good. It was, you know, this just dropped... You know, it's after a long time of doing related things, this one thing happened to go quite well. Um, and, and the same has been, to a certain extent, the same has been true with the, the new album as well. Um, you know, the, the, the plays have been off. It's, it's generally grown compared to stuff that was happening in the past. So could there be this, this, this moment at which some kind of penny drops out there for people? Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. Um, the only thing is, I don't know what it is that would make that happen. Yeah, um, yeah. I think as much as, as much as the music itself, it's about the world that's out there and what people are feeling at the time, what makes sense to them, what articulates something about the world that seems relevant. It's it's a combination of all of those things. So you, you don't know if it's going to happen, but is it impossible? No, I don't see why it's impossible. You know. can, can I ask, as someone that makes confrontational art, like... In the current era where mainstream music feels like it's got a more chilled out vibe, right? And like these adult contemporary fucking bullshit artists are <laughs> the people that that are, you know, the big names today, right? Like you're, you're, you're fucking, you know, all the, all the respects to their talents, but like your Adele's and your whatever, like that adult contemporary thing. Um, is there a place for extremity? Because you would think that with the world being fucking furious for the last couple of years, on, on either side of the fence, I don't care, like, wherever you sit, you're probably furious at the people on the other side and vice versa. We have lived in a furious world for recent years. Like, does that play a part, or, or does, that, the, does, the, does that make the things more likely for people to, to take it in? Like, do, have you got any take on where the world is for for an album like in darkenment because it sounds uh, definitely sonically it sounds like music for the times yeah i mean have you any take on where the world is now <laughs> <laughs> and go <laughs> um, yeah to, to, yeah to, I, I do think there's a place for that kind of thing and i because i don't get exposed to that much contemporary culture other than yeah. what I have to seek out myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm aware that Taylor Swift is immensely famous. but That's I, what I mean. 
you know, it's it's only within the past six months I've actually got an idea who Ed Sheeran is. You know, yeah, I, I, <laughs> right, I see. In that kind of way. You lucky know, you, lucky you, Dave. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I do think the stuff that, that has come along that's, that's found a, a new way of articulating a, a general sort of rage out there and stuff. So, I mean, you're in um, America at the moment, but tell from your accent where you come from, you know. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that's that's been on my radar fairly recently, you know, the past couple of years or whatever, the grime stuff that's coming out of London and, yes. and that kind of thing. Um, this is, as far as I can tell, I'm no expert on it. I mean, I'd, I'd look ridiculous, wouldn't I, if I were trying to be an expert on it. But it it seems to me that there is there with that grime scene. It's not the only thing, but it's an example. There is. Um, a, an articulation of a world that the rest of us didn't necessarily latch on to, but there's a lot of people out there for whom it resonates immensely and it's telling their story to the world um, in a way that wasn't happening until that kind of music came along. So, yeah, so long as there are people who feel kind of outside, who feel like they're... I mean, it doesn't have to be their rage or indignance or, or, or whatever, but what they feel about the world, whatever it happens to be, they find it's not being reflected back at them through music, through, you know, they don't feel there are people out there that they can latch on to who feel just the same way, then there's going to be an opportunity, there's going to be an opening in the world for someone to come along and go, you know what, this is how I feel. Yeah. And these people can see that someone else feels the same they can recognize themselves in the world that is presented to them in a way that wasn't there before so you know yeah i I absolutely think there is there is room for for some kind of new articulation there are there is room for outsider perspectives there is room for extremity and and all of that kind of thing I i definitely think so and it can it can even become huge i mean it's just the other day, I listen to all sorts of music. I do yeah. really weird stuff sometimes. But I was listening to some really comparatively mainstream stuff recently because there was a, a new box set that came out a couple of days ago that was all the Bob Marley albums that were released on Island Records. Mm. Um, and you listen to some of the... Yeah, there are songs where he's singing about love or whatever it is, but yeah. you listen to a lot of it, and that's it's, it's full of grit. Yeah, you know? protest music, man. Absolutely, yeah. But this, at it at the, at the time, it came in as an outsider thing. It came, mm. extreme would be the word, but it, but it was very different. Yeah. It was wrong to people's ears. But it, it just became absolutely enormous, um, and it's because it was saying something that people wanted to hear but weren't hearing. You know, mm. so I absolutely think there's there's room for that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's it's. Super inspiring to hear you talk about the the grime stuff that's going on in the UK because I like it, it's my fucking my job my mission in life is to somehow crowbar guitar music back into that because when I watch kids that were like I got into metal in the late nineties right like when I was a teenager and when I watch the the feral reaction to the drop in grime and SoundCloud rap and wherever the world's going. The pits and everything remind me exactly of when it was fucking corn or whoever when it was when I was that age. But yeah. do you think that's why it speaks volumes that Nathrak have got people excited because it's not just guitar, bass, drums and voices? Like, the I, I, I kind of um, hinted at it when we first started talking but the increase in sonic fidelity and headphones and how people consume music, plus your willingness to, I uh, mean, forward in Darkament, they, they've all got these like these big other things going on that are every bit as vital as the metallic uh, elements. Do you think that stops Nathrak being a band that's looked at as kind of because no one really sees Nathrak as like veterans, even though you're like, well, that was like our 10th album or whatever. Like, do you think that plays a part in it, that you are still looking to to create the future rather than replicate the past? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's when I, when I mentioned that that album was our 10th, um, it, it coincided with us having been going for 20 years, apparently. There you go, yeah. 
and that's the thing. I can say that word apparently and actually mean it because I didn't know that that was our 10th album and that we've been going 20 years until I did an interview and someone told me. Um, so, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, is there necessarily anything wrong with, with being a bit more retrospective? I mean, if you go and watch Judas Priest play live, you want to see them play Painkiller. And, that's what I've and, signed up for, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if they've released a new album, it's probably as much a vehicle as anything else. And if the, if there's a song on there that you definitely want to hear and play when they when they when you see them live, that's like a, a bonus that you weren't necessarily expecting. That's that's an unexpectedly good thing. And by no means do I mean to put down Judas Priest. I mean, yeah. that's a ridiculous. Obviously, of course, I don't. Um, Especially when the new Priest record fucking rips, Dave. <laughs> let me, let me. Put out a wicked album this year for fuck's sake. Yeah, that's it. I'm, everyone who I'm trying to scan myself for someone who's old and been on autopilot for ages. But anyway, think of your own, put them in the comments section. Sorry, Dave. Maybe so, yeah. Um, but there will be examples of people. Yes. Come up with that. But my point in saying it is that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, no one wanted to hear a new status quo album. Yeah. That didn't mean that it was a bad thing to see them at a festival or, or anything like that. There are bands that, that fit into that thing. I mean, years ago, I, d I did a tour. When I was with Benediction, we did a tour with Bolt Thrower. We did a couple, but we did a tour with Bolt Thrower. And one of the questions that that someone asked Gav, the guitarist, in, in an interview was, uh, you know, so, your new album, blah, blah, blah. And Gav's like, let me stop you there. We don't have a new album. We have an album, and every few years, we add a few more songs to it. You know, it's, it's not... It's not forward thinking. It's not trying to reinvent yourself, and there's nothing wrong with it in yeah. the right circumstances. But um, what you were saying about us, that doesn't tend to be the way we work, the way we're perceived, and all that kind of thing. Um, and we like it like that. We, we're not nostalgic. We're not sentimental. We're not backwards looking at all, to be honest. I mean, if if you pick like some fan favorite song from an album eight years ago or whatever it is, Mick probably hasn't listened to it in seven years. <laughs> um, the, the guys can't remember how to play most of it. Uh, you know, it's I'm not disowning our past catalog. That's yeah. not the way we do things. But we're always focused on what we're doing now, what we're doing next, what's exciting us at the time, all of that kind of thing. So the, the, there is a um, forward again there's a sense of forward momentum there's, mm. a, there's a, a looking towards what we might be able to do in the future that that is characteristic of us in a way it may or may not be for other bands like i say there's not necessarily anything wrong with it not being but our particular way of approaching things is very much you know future oriented and that kind of stuff and and when you're saying about the links to other kinds of music that we might draw on the stuff you know but you, you start out doing this kind of thing and you're listening to the stuff that sounds roughly like what you're doing yourself because you're a you know, you're young teenager, whatever it is. So, yeah, when we started out, we were listening to Mayhem. We were listening to the Immortal, you know, Napalm all the time, yeah. Extreme Noise Terror, whatever it is, um, just like... There's there's millions of kids out there who've started out listening to Slipknot, even Corn that you mentioned a minute yeah. ago. That's that's your starting point. Um, but as you go in, you draw in different stuff. You're excited by different things. And, and I mean, if you come to our dressing room when we're playing a gig somewhere, you're just as likely to hear Tommy Lee Sparta, right? He's like a, a dance hall guy. Yeah, he's like yeah. spooky and, and devilly and that. But it's proper dance hall ragger stuff. Mm. Or, Fucking, I don't know, but Sinatra, but whatever. I've only said Sinatra. We don't actually listen to Sinatra. We do listen to <laughs> yeah. Elvis. I'll give you that. We do yeah. listen to Elvis. Or Baptasia or whatever it is, Pendulum. Yeah. You know, you'll hear all of these sorts of stuff. And it's not because, like I say, we're not disowning our past catalogue. We're not disowning metal, anything like that. But you just you, your appreciation grows. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's a whole world of stuff out there. The last album I bought was Jeff Buckley, for God's sake. Oh, really? Right. So, like, I think the thing is, where where um, media and band maybe see this thing differently is, like, um, the, be the best way that I can word it when it comes to rock and metal and slightly my gripe when it comes to nostalgia is, so, like... Tommy, 
if I, if I would know the thing is, right, if I go to see a Stallone film in 2020, right, that's fine. And that's totally my own prerogative because I grew up on fucking Rocky and Copland and whatever, right? Um, but if if the world of action movies acts like that is still the pinnacle of action movies, right? And we're not getting the raid and we're not getting fucking John Wick and things that totally date action films that happened before it, right? If it's not progressing, then that is my opinion why rock music has been in the bin for the last decade. Like, I'm not a rock is dead guy at all, but I'm a we got to do something about this before we are kind of person. Like, um, and I think the reason why it's important that Nathrak and bands like you are out there is because I hear it and I hear 2020. Right. That's, well, that, that's more what I, where I was coming from. Like, don't get me wrong, man. I'll still pay my tickets for... Well, I probably wouldn't pay my tickets for a Bruce Willis film these days. Bad run of, <laughs> bad run of form for the last decade. But you know what I'm saying. Actually, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like that kind of thing. Like, I, like I, I, I can still go for the nostalgia. I, I can, I can visit the nostalgia market. I just don't want to live there. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean, and and it, it can sometimes feel like that way with with metal and stuff, especially extreme metal. You know, I, I can, yeah. I can think of few extreme metal albums that are as exciting to me as as something I'm about to put on. Now, you know, say we finish this interview and I'm about to put, you know, it, Slaughter of the Soul, that I just think, brilliant, I'll put yeah. that on. Yeah. And that's, you know, what, 25 years old or something like that. It is now, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's, yeah, as we were both saying, there's nothing wrong with that. It's it's still incredible. Yeah. Um, but there, there does tend to be sometimes a little bit of a lack of newness, mm. a little bit of a drive towards it. Um, and the world is big enough for all of it, but... The likes of us, I would like to hope. Maybe I'm wrong, but I would like to hope that we're among the more forward-looking things. You know, tomorrow is going to be a bigger day for us than yesterday was, and I hope that's how we can approach things in general. You know, and what a brilliant way to look at things going into the new year. So I hope 2021 is even better than 2020. I cannot wait for you to get touring. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's can't kind of, yeah, can't be hard, can it? Like for for the love of fuck, can twenty twenty one be better than the year twenty twenty? Dave, thank you so much for taking the time on a Friday night. The new Nathrak album is out now. It's called In Darkenment. If you haven't heard it, you need it like you need the oxygen in your lungs. Dave, thank you so much, man. Nice, mate. No worries. Thank you.